Good morning, welcome to our uh, Sunday morning service here at Peniel in Maestig. Very warm welcome to you if you're joining us for the first time. It's great to have you with us. And Peniel members, um, really glad you could find us as well. Now, um, as we're doing this, you might be visiting and you might be here for the first time. We really want to make sure that you feel welcome. If you are visiting us, uh, as we say now every week, we, we would love to give you a warm welcome. But obviously we don't know if you're tuning in. So let us know. Drop us a, a note if you're on the church website. You'll find that um, underneath the video. If you're on YouTube, click on the link underneath the description and that'll help. Um, that'll point you to our webpage and you can just get in touch. But it is great to be together. Um, in this way, uh, we can't wait to meet back together. We're missing being together, aren't we? This is um, uh, not, not uh, as we want to be, but we pray now that God would really give us the perseverance uh, that's needed till we're back together again. Uh, the songs that we uh, can sing this morning are in the description as well. A playlist there of songs that will help us look and focus on what we're looking at this morning. Now we're back in Exodus this morning. We started that last week, Exodus chapter 1. So we're now in Exodus chapter 2. But before we do that, let me pray. Uh, commit this time to God and then we'll look at that passage together. Let's pray. We do thank you, Lord, that you are a God who we can come to in our time of need and our time of um, sorrow often, and we can come to you and, and plead with you to help us. We thank you, Lord, that as Psalm 121 tells us, as we lift our eyes, as we look to the hills, where does our help come from? Our help comes from the Lord, the, the creator of heaven and earth. The one who made all is also our uh, God. And we thank you, Lord, that you hear us now. As we look at the world around us, Lord, we admit and we see again our desperate need for you. Please come, Lord. Please help us uh, and, and guide us as your people. In this time we've got together now, we pray you'd speak to us. We pray, Lord, that you would use this time and to encourage if we need encouraging, to challenge if we need challenging, to save if we need saving. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let's turn then to Exodus chapter 2. Exodus chapter 2. And I'll read this passage for us. Then we'll spend some time looking at it together. Now, a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she took for him a basket made out of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the river bank. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done to him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her young woman walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman and she took it. When she opened it, she saw the child and behold, the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrew children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and call you a nurse from the Hebrew woman to nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. So the girl went and called the child's mother and Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and the nurse and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him, and when the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she became her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him up out of the water. One day, when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens, and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that, and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. When he went out the next day, behold, two, two Hebrews were struggling together. And he said to the man in the wrong, why do you strike your companion? He answered, who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, surely the thing is known. When Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Now the priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came and drew water and filled the troughs to water their father's flock. The shepherds came and drove them away, but Moses stood up and saved them, and he watered their flock. When they came home to their father Ruel, he said, How is it that you have come home so soon today? They said, An Egyptian delivered us out of the hand of the shepherds, and even drew water for us and watered the flock. He said to his daughters, then where is he? Why have you left the man? Call him uh, that he may eat bread. And Moses was content to dwell with the man and he gave Moses his daughter Zipporah. She gave birth to a son and he called his name Gershom. For he said, 
I have been a sojourner in a foreign land. During those many days, the king of Egypt died and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. Their cry for rescue came from, from slavery came up to God. God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel and God knew. We started looking at Exodus last week and the word Exodus means a, a way out, an exit. And how God saves his people uh, in that situation that they're in. And, you know, in our life, we're all longing for an exit, a way out. Maybe at the moment we're longing for an exit from the lockdown restrictions we're under. But generally in life, through our struggles and our doubts, through our guilt and our shame, through the questions we ask, through our darkness, through our despair, we're longing for a, a way out, an exit. We need an exodus. And what we're seeing, going to see in this book is that the God who saves you, is the God who can save us. God doesn't change. He is the same God. Uh, the Israelites' God can be our God. Their story is our story. Their saviour is our saviour. And as we behold God in this book, my prayer for us is that we see and understand what he is like. We, we live for him and we, we are saved and rescued by him and we put our trust in him um, even more. Now, in chapter one, we notice that um, in this all, God was silent, as in God didn't talk. And we see the same in chapter 2. There's a, there's a tension here, because we're waiting for God to intervene, but he doesn't seem to be doing anything. God seems absent. He seems silent. And he doesn't speak, and it's a deliberate device by the writer. You know, we're waiting, we're waiting, we're waiting, until in verses 23, 24, 25, where we see God starting to do something. But what we're going to see in chapter 2 is this. Even though God can seem absent, he is always working out his purposes. Even though God can seem absent, he is always working out his purposes. Now, we can often wonder, can't we, uh, God, where are you and, and, and what are you doing? And it's hard to see what he's up to when we're at ground level looking at um, our life. But we're going to look at three areas. Three areas where we often doubt God's presence and we're going to see that in those areas, God is working. He is sovereign, even in his silence. First place we're going to look is God in our suffering. Then we'll look at God in our failure and then God in our prayer. So first of all, God in our suffering. And we see this in verses 1 to 10. Now, a quick recap on last week. Last week, we saw that the uh, Israelites were growing. The nation was growing. And there was a new king who didn't know Joseph and the family. And he was scared. He thought this nation was growing so fast it was going to take over. So he imposes drastic measures on them and uses them and oppresses them as slaves. But the nation keeps growing. So he talks to the midwives and he tells them, you must kill any boy that is born. But those midwives refuse. So the nation keeps growing. And then the horrendous final stage is he issues out a decree to all Egyptians to throw any baby boy from the Hebrews into the Nile. What a dark thing. But that's where we pick up the story. And Moses in the bulrushes in chapter 2, the start of it here, is quite a familiar story. And if you went to Sunday school, uh, you probably remember kind of colouring in a picture of this baby in a basket in the bulrushes. And, uh, and we can kind of have a, a kind of sanitised view of it. But look what's happening here. Any male who's born is to be thrown by any Egyptian into the Nile. It's a dark situation. But into that situation, what happens? A baby's born. And this baby, the parents look at him and see he's a fine child in verse 2 and they, uh, they can't do what the Pharaoh has issued the decree to do. But they try and hide him. But they got to the stage where they couldn't hide him anymore. And so what does his mother do? Well, his mother builds this, we're told, this ark. That's what it's called, an ark. And she, puts, she builds it and um, she coats it in bitumen and pitch. And, and then she puts him in this child, they put this child in this ark and lays him in the Nile. Now again, let's not kind of think Sunday school picture stories, cartoon stories here. Think of the reality of that. Think of the darkness. Think of the pain of the heartache, the tears as this mother was laying her dear child into the river and pushing him down. But what happens next? Well, it just so happens in verse 5 that Pharaoh's daughter comes to bathe. And she discovers this baby. Miriam is sent, as Moses' sister, sent close by to kind of keep an eye on it. And she ends up 
offering the services of a mother to bring up this baby who then is paid for, uh, the mother is paid to look after her son. So here we are faced by something dark and horrendous. The children are being killed. And the regime of Pharaoh, this new Pharaoh, seems to be flexing his muscles. And we can ask, ground level, God, where are you? What, what are you doing? He seems absent. He is silent in one sense. But when we look closer, look what God is doing. Here are the Israelites and they're in a desperate situation and God brings a child into the world. A child who's going to rescue. A child that's brought into a family who in Hebrews 11 we're told, by faith put this baby into the Nile. And at just the right time, when a Pharaoh's daughter, at just the right time when a Pharaoh's daughter is there, this baby is then uh, brought out and then her mother, uh, the baby's mother, brings the baby up and is paid to do so. But this baby is then brought up in the palace, educated in the ways of Egypt, uh, benefiting from all these things. And God has one of his people with access to the throne of Egypt. Now, where is God? We can ask that initially, can't we? But look, God is in every detail. He can use the darkest, most heartbreaking situation for his glory. Now, there's one uh, illustration of how God can use a tough situation to, to bring something for his glory. Um, in uh, the Soviet Union, back in the 1930s and 40s. And who does God use to do some amazing work with uh, among Uzbek villages? God uses the actions of Joseph Stalin. Let me tell you the story. Um, thousands of Koreans uh, fled what was then North Korea in the 1930s because the Japanese invaded. And many of them settled in a place called Vladivostok. Um, and Stalin, in the late 1930s and 40s, began developing Vladivostok as a weapons manufacturing centre. And he didn't like the Koreans being there. He saw them as a security risk. risk. So he relocated um, them to five different areas in the Soviet Union. And one area he sent a load of Koreans to was Tashkent. Now, the Tashk there, when they were moved there, the Uzbeks who were there, um, they were a 20 million strong Muslim uh, community. Hundreds of years, they'd violently opposed anybody coming to share the message of Jesus with them. But the Koreans settled there and the Uzbeks really welcomed their industry and their kindness. And within a few decades, the Koreans were part of every area of the Uzbeks' life. Um, and among, these among the Koreans were, were strong Christian believers. And among them, God started this mighty revival uh, while they were there. So here they were, these Koreans broke out into revival and they were uh, living their lives amongst these Uzbeks. And what happened? Loads of Uzbeks and Kazakhs as well came to know Jesus through the witness of these Korean believers. Now the Korean believers, think of what they went through. They had to flee their homeland and they settled somewhere. And then Stalin comes along and sends them somewhere else. What are they thinking in those moments? God, what are you doing? Where are you? But God had a plan to reach these Uzbeks who nobody else could reach by the Koreans' love, kindness and him moving in mighty power through them. God had a loving plan, even though it was tough, even though uh, it didn't make sense at ground level. God was working out his sovereign will. Corrie Ten Boom's got another great way of explaining this. Corrie Ten Boom was a Jewish Christian who was taken to a concentration camp in Ravensbrück in the Second World War. But listen to a poem she wrote. My life is but a weaving between my God and me. I cannot choose the colours. He weaveth steadily. Oft times he weaveth sorrow. And I in foolish pride forget he sees the upper and I the underside. Not till the loom is silent and the shuttles cease to fly will God unroll the canvas and reveal the reason why. The dark threads are as needful in the weaver's skilful hand, as the threads of gold and silver in the pattern he has planned. He knows, he loves, he cares. Nothing this truth can dim. He gives the very best to those who leave their choice to him. See, God can use the darkest of threads in our story. And even though we can only see the back uh, of this tapestry, God is making this beautiful picture. And the very things that Pharaoh tries to use to destroy God's people were the things that God used to bring hope and salvation, isn't it? He brought a child into this world, a baby boy. This baby was to be the saviour. He brought 
uh, and he saved the child through being placed in the Nile, which is where he was telling everybody to be, to be thrown, the babies to be thrown, to be killed. In our suffering, we can often think God is absent. And we can wonder, God, where are you? But you see what this is telling us about God. Even when he appears absent, even when he appears silent, he is still lovingly working out his purposes. So that very thing that is causing you heartache and pain at the moment, God can use for his glory. He can use to give you hope and help through it all. And also, do you see what that means? It means that our suffering and our trials aren't pointless, but that God has a purpose for them. And even though God might appear silent, even though he might appear absent, nothing can stop his purposes. Maybe you're not a Christian watching this. You know, we can easily push God out, can't we? We can easily say, God, I don't want you. Because I look at the suffering around, maybe the suffering in your life or the suffering in this world, and we think, there is no way I can believe in God if that is happening. But you've got to realise what you're doing as you're believing that. As you push God out, what you are accepting is this. There is absolutely no purpose or reason for any of the suffering in this world. It is pointless and random. When you push God out, that's what you're believing. But when you bring God in, you're also bringing in hope that God can use this for good. That God can use this for his glory. There's something in these verses and as we kind of think on suffering and trusting God in the midst of it. It might sound okay, you know. If, if we're just thinking without us being in there. But when we're in there, it's hard and we, we kind of struggle and we doubt. But where do we go when we doubt? We've got to go to Jesus. How can God really be sovereign in my darkness? How can God really use suffering for good? Well, look at the other child who's born. And he's born into a situation where all the babies are being killed. And he is, um, he is rescued from that. And he faced in his life heartache and rejection and pain. And eventually Jesus faced death on the cross. And Jesus shows us that God is a God with scars. He knows what it's like to struggle. He knows what it's like to suffer. He gets it. And this is where we see the saviour in darkness. He comes in darkness and he can use that darkness for our good. The very thing that looked like the end, his death, is actually our hope. The death looks like the final, the enemy, the greatest enemy God goes through that. Jesus uses that and rescues us through death. See, so God in our suffering, that's the first thing we see. Secondly now, let's look at God in our mistakes and in our failure. Moses, by verse 11, is now 40 years old and he's been brought up in the palace, but he still knows he's not an Egyptian. You see that in verse 11, because he sees an Egyptian beating one of his people now Moses as he looked on this situation um, his there's a lot to commend him for here he looks at uh, somebody who is one of his people and he, he his heart goes out to him he, he wants to help but what he does he does in a foolish way and in a rash way because he tries doesn't he in verse 12 he looks this way and that there's a sign that he's doing something that he shouldn't be doing and he, he he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand act 7 tells us that Moses is hoping that this is his announcement to his people that he has come to rescue and then his people reject him. And even though there's lots of good motives here, we also see that he does this in a way that is foolish and rash. And maybe a bit of arrogance as well and pride, thinking he's the one who's come to do it. And we see in verse um, 14, uh, when he sees another two Hebrews arguing uh, a bit later the next day, uh, they say to him, who made you a prince and a judge over us? Do you mean to kill me as you killed the Egyptians? And then Moses was afraid and he thought the thing is known. The Pharaoh finds out about it and he sought to kill Moses and so Moses fled. You see, as Moses is doing this, um, he, he, he makes mistakes. He fails. He acts rashly and arrogantly. And Moses is then away from Egypt for 40 years. And he ends up in Midian. Can you imagine? He's in the middle of nowhere. He's in the wilderness. Can you imagine how he felt? This prince of Egypt almost was now nowhere. What have I done? I've ruined my life. I've ruined everything. I've spoilt it all. What have I done? But you see, even in his failure, he wasn't beyond God's good hand. Even in his failure, he wasn't beyond God's good hand. Notice what happens when he moves to Midian. 
when he moved to Midian, here is somebody who had a very comfortable life in Egypt, but now he knew what it was to suffer, to go through discomfort. He had all the luxury of Egypt, but now he had nothing and he was humbled hugely. Here he spends 40 years in Midian, in the wilderness, looking after sheep. He's a shepherd, sheep who are stubborn, sheep who get lost, sheep who need lots of patience. Well, that's going to come in handy for when he has to rescue God's people and spend 40 years in the wilderness guiding them to the promised land. And then we see that he protects these women and he ends up marrying one of them and having a child. So he's learning family life. Here, Moses fails, but God doesn't give up on him. God uses this failure and he redeems it. Throughout this time, Moses has been prepared for the next stage. Throughout this time, Moses has been humbled. He's been trained. He's been used. God is using this tough situation and he's changing Moses through it. He's working in him and he's rescuing him. He's saving him. You know, it is so often that God brings things into our life that is uncomfortable, that are hard, because it's the only way that he can show us things about ourselves that we never would have seen. Sin in our heart, things we depend on, attitudes that we have that no other situation could have shown us. There's a fairy tale told about a, a wicked witch and she lived in a remote cottage in the deep forest and travellers would come through and they'd be looking for lodging. But what would happen was this, she would offer them a meal and a bed, but uh, it was the most comfortable bed that you'd ever sleep in. But there was a bed full of dark magic and if you were asleep when the sun came up, you'd be turned to stone. And then you'd be a figure in the Queen's kind of statuary place uh, for, and you're trapped there till the end of time. Now there's another person in the story, a young girl who was one of the witch's servants and she had no power to resist the witch but she did really feel for these people who were coming in and lodging for these victims. So one day this young man comes in and he was offered bed and board uh, but the servant girl just couldn't face seeing another person being turned to stone. So what does she do? She put in sticks and stones and thistles in his bed so that in the night he was really uncomfortable. He couldn't get to sleep. He would toss and he would turn and and he really didn't have a good night at all. So he woke up long before dawn and he was leaving the front door and he saw the servant girl and he said, how could you give this traveller such a terrible bed full of sticks and stones? And he went on, uh, went on his way. But she said this under her breath. Ah, the misery you know now is nothing like the infinitely greater misery a comfortable sleep would have brought you. Those are my sticks and stones of love. You see, God brings sticks and stones and thistles into our lives because he loves us. He wants us to see the danger that we're in if we keep uh, following this path of sin that we're on. If we keep uh, wandering away from him. He loves us too much to let us go down that path. See, God has a purpose for us. It can be uncomfortable, but he is using that for our good. You think of Joseph just before Exodus starts. Joseph and his brothers. Joseph... There he was, an arrogant young man, uh, but his brothers hated him and they were bitter towards him. They threw him in a pit, sold him to slavery. He ended up, being, um, ended up in prison, being forgotten about. But by the end of the story, his brothers come back. And what does he say to his brothers? Don't fear. Am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. To bring about that many people should be kept alive. Now maybe you're watching this and you're thinking, well, I've failed too much. I've done too many wrong things, too many mistakes, and there's no hope for me at all. But God can use our failings for his good purposes. He can redeem them. That's our God, redeeming these situations. And again, when we doubt that, look at our saviour. Look at his death on the cross. He takes betrayal and denial. He takes lies and injustice. And he uses that in a way that was our hope. And he also uses that because he knows that's the only way that we can be forgiven. What a God of grace we've got. If this morning you are trusting in Jesus, remember now that he has forgiven you. He has cleansed you from all the wrong you've done. And he can use your mistakes and your failures for our good. Now that doesn't give us license to just go and sin and say, oh, it doesn't matter because God can just use us for good. Not at all. When we do wrong, and when we go against God's ways, there will be effects of that. Sin is never in isolation. It always will affect someone. Uh, so when we sin, uh, there will be consequences. But God can use even those dark and sad consequences 
for a good purpose. We can trust him. So God can use even our failures. This morning, if we feel full of guilt and shame, look at Jesus. His arms are wide open and he's saying, come to me, come to me. So God in our suffering, God in our mistakes. And the last thing is this, God in our prayer. As we've seen, God is very present in this passage, even though he might not obviously seem so. But at the end of this passage, the people of God reach out. They reach this crisis point. They are weak and they reach the end of their resources and they cry out to God. And then God responds. And it's almost like these verses, there's a shift, there's a gear shift. God then kind of is, is, is spurred into action. Now we've seen he is working, he is working out his purposes. But what is it that makes a difference? What changes the gear as it were? What happens from these verses onwards? Prayer. God's people cry out to him and God uses that. That is the catalyst to God working in power. And we're told these four deeply encouraging words about God, aren't we? God heard, God remembered, God saw and God knew. He heard, he remembered, he saw and he knew. Now just as we close, what a challenge that is to us to ask. Have we been neglecting prayer? Because two big reasons we do is we have the wrong view of us and we have the wrong view of God. See, the wrong view of us, we think, you know, if we're not praying and if we don't pray, we're effectively saying to God, I can do this on my own. I don't need you. I, I've got the insight and the wisdom and the strength and the ability to do this on my own. We might not say that out loud, but that is what we believe by not praying. Prayer is us acknowledging, God, I am weak and I need you. God, help me. The Israelites were brought to their knees here and their cry to God um, moves him into action. We can also, if we're not praying, it's because we don't really understand who God is. We think he's distant, uncaring, unmoved, not powerful enough to help us. But notice what we're told here in these four words. Verse 24, first of all, he heard their groaning. God heard, the God of heaven heard the cry of these people. Now, sometimes in prayer, when we come to God, we don't know what to say. And maybe we're in such a dark spot that that's all we can do is groan. And we don't know what to say. See, the Bible tells us that God can interpret that. He, he gets it. He understands. Romans 8 tells us the Spirit intercedes for us. It just, just cry out to God. Don't worry about getting the words right. Go to him because he hears. Not only does he hear, but verse 24 tells us he remembers his covenant. He remembers his promise. He said, I made a promise with Abraham that I am going to rescue my people and that there's going to be one from them who will be the hope of the world. I remember that promise. Now, this isn't telling us that God had forgotten it, but he's remembering it and, and saying, look, I'm going to be brought into action by uh, the remembrance of this promise. Not that he's forgotten it. And when we look at how God works in the Bible, we often see that he has moved into action by being reminded of his promises, by God's people pleading his promises in prayer. So in a way that we can't really grasp, God uses uh, us reminding him of his promises as part of his way to fulfil those promises. God uses us pleading God's promises as part of his method and his way to fulfil those promises. That's what we need to do in prayer. Take God's promises to him. Thomas Manton, the 17th century Puritan, said, plead the promises of God in, hair, in, in prayer. Show him his handwriting. He is tender to his word. Let's read with our Bibles open. Let's pray, sorry, with our Bibles open. Let's pray God's word to him. He is working out his purposes at his own uh, speed and his own time. God remembered. Let's remind him of his promises in prayer. And the last two words there, verse 25, he saw and he knew. What a comfort to know that God sees what's happening in your life. Maybe nobody else knows the struggles you're going through. Nobody else knows the doubts, the questions, the the, the guilt, the shame, whatever it is, nobody else knows, but God does. What an intimate word that is as well, to know. He intimately knows what's going on in your life. Now that doesn't take away the pain. It doesn't answer all of the questions. But that the God of heaven, the God who made you, the God who created the universe, knows your situation. He cares about you. He sees you. He listens. And when we see that, then... Then we want to pray to him. Then we see I can take all of these things I'm carrying to my God in prayer. And remember what we're told about this God? When we look at um, God in the flesh, we see that God is one who prays for us. 
You know, Jesus knows our situation. Jesus knows our needs and he prays. He intercedes for his people. God is, uh, Jesus is praying for you right now by name. And that is hope. That gives us hope through our trials and our suffering. Now, does God seem silent in your life? Does he seem absent? Well, notice, in your suffering, in your mistakes, through prayer, God has never left. He is present, even in his silence. And when we look at our Saviour, we remember that we've got a Saviour who suffered. We've got a Saviour who cleanses us from our failure. And we've got a Saviour who intercedes for us. We've got a Saviour who says, I've never leave you. I will never forsake you. I'm always there. So let's keep our eyes on Jesus. Let's keep our eyes on our Saviour. And if we're going through times of suffering, or times of shame, or times of dryness, let's look at our God, a God who is uh, remembers, a God who hears, a God who knows, and a God who sees. Let's pray uh, before we finish our time together. We thank you, Lord, for this time. We thank you that you're a God who answers and hears prayer. We thank you, Lord, that you're a God who uses even the darkest times for your good. And I pray for anybody watching this who is going through a particularly dark time. Lord, give them hope, give them help and strengthen them through it, we pray. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. OK, well, um, thank you for joining us and we hope you can join us again uh, next week.